Nosferatu, adapted from the screenplay by Henrik Galin, by C. Augustine, read by the author. Preface. The author does not wish to go on and on at length as to his adaptation of Nosferatu. It was completed chiefly because it were impossible for him to do otherwise. It was a project too tempting, too perfect, too darkly enchanting not to eventually undertake. Though we have departed here and there from Herr Galin's original script, we have remained, as it were, scrupulously faithful. Put down our departures to necessity, if you must, artistic license at the very least. Nosferatu, made in 1922, is a film both horrifyingly stark and iconically brilliant. Its images present a vampire tale out of the worst and most fearful, dire aspects of the Victorian imagination. The film's vampire, Orlok, unlike the suave, sexy Lugosi, or even later interpretations, is a rat-like, cadaverous, verminous living corpse. A silent film grotesque as mad and menacing as a literal reanimated cadaver. He carries death with him in his wake, a reverse Pied Piper of Hamelin bringing the rats with him instead of leading them, and finally the children away. He seems to stink of must and mildew and rats and blood. His eyes are ferocious and mad and also insensate and sometimes even a little stupid. There is nothing robust, human, or remotely attractive about him. He is a stiff, comeback to repellent, parasitic, diseased life. The rest, as they say, is simply a light and shadow show. Or rather, that is how Omar Khayyam termed it. And it is only a movie. But it brings the gothic trope of the vampire to life in a way that has seldom ever been equaled. Actually, never. And we write this on Halloween. And we wonder. See Augustine, October 31st, 2019. Nosferatu, adapted from the screenplay by Henrik Galin, by C. Augustine, 2018 to 2019. Nosferatu, that name alone can chill the blood. Nosferatu, was it he who brought the plague to Visborg in 1838? I have long sought the causes of that terrible epidemic and found at its origin and its climax the innocent figures of Jonathan Hutter and his young wife Ellen. From the diary of Johann Cavilius, able historian of the native city of Wisborg. Wisborg, 1838. It was morning, the daylight peeping above the trees as the handsome young Jonathan Hutter prepared himself in the mirror, carefully buttoning his collar, tying his tie, and freshening his skin with a bit of cream before looking in the mirror to find himself, as they say, quote, quite presentable, unquote. His young wife Ellen was toying with the cat. Oh, Jonathan, she said, running to him, you must sit yourself for a bit of breakfast. You need your strength. He brushed her aside, perhaps a little too indelicately. Ellen, I have no time. Herr Nock has asked me to come to the office very early this morning to discuss an important business arrangement. I don't have time to eat. I'll be late. At hearing this, Ellen looked downcast. Then Hutter took her in his arms and said, I promise I'll be back for lunch and we'll eat together this afternoon, all right? She looked up at him, seemingly a little tearful, but said, all right. Good. And with that, he kissed her on the chin and slipped out the door. He was gone. The sun was beaming brightly on the streets of Visborg, the odd little town whose cobbled streets and alleyways, old houses hinting at Dutch windmills and wooden bridges and gentle wharfs, all bespoke a charm that was old and picturesque, like the seamed and worn face of a beautiful painting, perhaps. 
Jonathan Hutter liked the clop-clop of hooves on the cobbles, the rattle of wheels, the friendly faces of his fellow town folk, one of whom, an aged and seemed old man, who seemed to have been alive for time out of mind, came forth and greeted him. Morning, Master Hutter, he said, grabbing the hand and doffing the hat. Jonathan smiled, but turned the greeting. But you must slow down, young man. You cannot outrun your fate. Jonathan thought this a peculiar thing for the old man to say, but smiled nonetheless. Finally, the, the old man, who possessed an uncanny strength, it seemed, let go, and Jonathan proceeded on his way. Upon rounding a corner, he spied the wooden sign that said, Knock and Sons, Solicitors. It was his present place of employment. Hutter looked through the window and the door. Inside, Knox sniveled and giggled as he held the letter clenched in his grubby, ink-stained hands. Hutter entered, dusting off his boots, and climbed the rickety stair upward to the landing where the huge, heavy, dusty law books and other worm-eaten old volumes were kept. Ah, if only walls could speak, thought Jonathan merrily. What would such walls say? He didn't truly know, but he apprised his superior knock with a wary, if not particularly prejudiced, eye. After all, Jonathan was always saying to himself, a man may have his eccentricities, but that doesn't necessarily make him a bad man. Sunlight gleamed in through the window, sending up eddies and swirling motes of dust in the air. Knock said, here is an important letter from Transylvania. Count Orlock wishes to buy a house in our city. It's a good opportunity for you, Hutter. The Count is rich and free with his money. You will have a marvelous journey, and young as you are, what matter if it costs you some pain, or even a little blood? The house facing yours, that should suit him. Leave at once, my young friend, and don't be frightened if people speak of Transylvania as the land of phantoms. The land of phantoms, thought Jonathan, with a slight tremor in his bones. Did such a place actually exist? He thought of Transylvania as an exotic storybook land, a place bordering the world of the Turk, a gateway wherein Europe and the Orient met and blended, Land of phantoms, indeed. That night, Hutter was attempting to console Ellen as to the fact that he had a long, arduous journey to make. I may be away for several weeks, Ellen, Jonathan said, eating his dinner while Ellen absently played with the cat. Nock is sending me to some lost corner of the Carpathians. At hearing this, she seemed troubled. Oh, Jonathan, why must you go? I become so worried when Knox sends you on these long excursions. You know how lonely I get when we are forced to be apart, how I long for your face when I am gone. I will be fine. We will see each other again soon enough. Now settle down. You will be fine staying with the Hardings while I am away. Ellen pleaded. Oh, Jonathan, must you go? Hutter tried to be understanding of her fear, but felt a little as if he were losing his patience nonetheless. Yes, of course I must. It's my livelihood. We must have a dependable income upon which to live. Why, an opportunity like this could really advance my career. Now, let us finish dinner. Relax and forget all about it for tonight. I will leave in the morning. But he knew she could not forget. That next morning, he helped Ellen mount the back of his horse, and together they rode to the home of the Hardings. The Hardings were old friends of Ellen. Very well-to-do they were, a prominent family. And they had loved Ellen since she was but a young girl. Annie and Ellen had always been such close friends, and now... With Ellen married, it became more and more difficult for the two women to conspire to spend time together. Except, of course, for the odd tea or luncheon. Hutter was not long in conversing, but Mr. Harding took him aside and said, Ellen tells us you are going far, Jonathan, to the wilds of the Carpathians. 
In fact, I tell you, that is a very mysterious and even dangerous country. You must be cautious here. And Mr. Harding held forth an old flintlock pistol, but Hutter wouldn't hear of it. Oh, I shall not be needing that old thing. I mean, I think you kindly, but I'm certain I'll be safe enough aboard the stagecoach. Mr. Harding looked a little embarrassed or downcast, perhaps, but asked, Where is it you are going? To Transylvania, replied Hutter, cheerily enough, to meet Graf Orlock. He wants to buy a house in Bremen. Mr. Harding said, Take it with you anyway, my friend. And so Jonathan did, although he was not even certain a gun so old would still fire. It was not very long before Jonathan was ready to ride out. Ellen, who had been lurking in the yard, rushed out to meet him. She clasped him in her arms as Ruth watched from the doorway, dabbing her eyes with a silk kerchief. Oh, Jonathan, cried Ellen, I'll miss you so much. Do be safe and come home soon. Write to me. I will, Ellen, I promise. And with that, Jonathan Hutter rode away into the rising sun. Transylvania. Transylvania seemed a wild, mountainous country as seen from the dusty, rattling coach. A place of rocky precipice, deep black forest, gulf-like ravines that seemed to dip through the dark nightshade specter of Hades. Above, the star-strewn sky saw it all with wonder. Along the road, rotting barns that must have been ancient before Jonathan's great-great-grandmother was born, abutted weed-choked fields, shared terrain with the rocky ruins of old keeps. Along the way, picturesque peasants in huge pants, white shirts, and black nail-studded boots with belts of red stripe and hungry, lean, weather-stained faces, led carts pulled by loafing oxen and skeletal nag. It's like a scene from a storybook, said Hutter to the driver, in almost wonder. Predictably, the driver said nothing. It was not long before they disembarked at a little village inn. Driver, said Hutter, no need to take my bags down. I'm going on to Borgo Pass in the morning. The driver looked down from his seat as if to say, You are a madman, my friend, or a fool, or both, but did as he was told. Jonathan, famished from his long journey, went into the inn. The inside was dark and dank and smelled of must and spilt beer, pipe smoke and greasy food. Except for a few old villagers playing cards at a table, the place seemed deserted. He waited and waited. There was seemingly no one to wait on him. Finally, he slapped the table with his open palm. Dinner, quickly! I should already be at Count Orlock's castle! Suddenly, worried faces bobbed at the end of withered old necks. Beady eyes seemed to look worried, furtive glances at him. The fat man, the innkeeper, came out from the kitchen, finally wiping his hands on his apron. Where, he asked, did you specifically say you were going, sir? Why, answered Hutter curiously, to Count Orlock's castle in the mountains. I have important business there. At this, the innkeeper seemed to be aghast. You must not leave now. The evil spirits become all-powerful after dark, the man said with a raised hand of trepidation. Jonathan merely laughed. Why nonsense, he said dismissively. Why, that's just silly old superstitious nonsense, my friend. But the innkeeper was firm in his disapproval. Do you know what tonight is, sir? The night of all nights, a Pergusnacht. That he had never before heard such a curious word, tilted his head quizzically and said, "While Pergusnacht? Why, what on earth does that mean?" To which the innkeeper replied, "It is the evilest night, the most unholy night of the year. It is a night when the devil and his children walk the earth in human form, and there are witches." And vampires, too. Hutter felt quite certain that the man was mad. However, he said to himself, these old peasant folk were steeped in superstitious nonsense. He said, why, my good man, this is the 19th century. Surely you don't mean to tell me you believe 
in all that sort of rubbish. Suddenly the man's wife came forward. She took a crucifix from around her neck and, muttering a prayer in her native tongue, placed it around his neck, kissing it first. She tried to speak a few words of German, for all he could make out was, For your mama. And then she said five words that he clearly did understand. Den die Toten rieten schnell. For the dead travel fast. For the dead travel fast. Now what on earth did she mean by that? Having finally dined on a curious few dishes, won some sort of chicken with paprika, which made him very thirsty, Hutter went to his room, made a hasty toilet, and was about to crawl into bed when he saw a huge old book left out on the bedside table. Unaccountably, it was in German. The title was The Book of the Vampires, or some such nonsense. Yawning, but suddenly curious, he opened it up and began to read. Quote, and it was in 1443 that the first Nosferatu was born. That name rings like the cry of a bird of prey. Never speak it aloud. Men do not always recognize the dangers that beasts can sense at certain times. He read for a bit more, smiling, shushing away his creeping anxiety. Sure, after all, it was simply the result of sleeping in a strange bed, in a strange room, in an even stranger country, and telling himself that it was all, after all, a, quote, good lot of rubbish, unquote. He put the book down, put out the candle, and settled down to try and sleep. After all, he had a big day tomorrow. Outside, unbeknownst to him, the mean and creeping things of the night slithered and crawled beneath his window, and a hyena howled in the dark, startling the horses, as old wives cowered behind bolted doors, holding their crucifixes and rosaries, and muttering older, pagan incantations against the evils in the gathering gloom. The drive through the mountains was dusty and dirty and long, and seemed treacherous. Passing on roads leading up over dangerous cliffs that fell far below to crushing rocky depths, Hutter looked with a growing sense of unease out the window of the coach as the scenery, the deep, limitless forests of trees, swept by in the twilight of this weird, forgotten land. Already long shafts of deep sundown penetrated the trees, and Jonathan could feel the spectral touch of a forgotten world penetrate his soul like the cold, lonely chill of death. He shuddered. Beside him, a passenger who was dressed in a shabby suit, who may have been some middling government bureaucrat, Jonathan guessed, leaned from the coach window and snapped at the driver. Hurry, the sun will soon be setting. Indeed, thought Jonathan, again having the feeling of uneasiness, a feeling as if somehow he was in danger of being lost. He hoped and prayed there would be a hearty repast also when he finally arrived at the castle. He was now famished. And good drink as well, he thought. I could use a snifter of brandy. It was at a place called the Borgo Pass where the driver stopped, reining in the horses. Bending down to peer in at his passengers, he stated, We will go no further, sir, not for a fortune. We will go no further. Here begins the land of the phantoms and quite abruptly he threw down Hutter's luggage. It landed in the dirt, and the man, much perturbed, dove forward to pick it up. Well, so I see this is how they treat foreigners in this strange, godforsaken backwater. But as the coach drove away madly, Hutter could see that calling this place a backwater could hardly be assessed as an accurate description. This was no little rural burg. This was a mountainous wilderness. Ahead, the pathway ran into a wooden bridge. Hutter walked to it, crossed, not liking the creak of rotting wood beneath his boots. The whole thing might come to pieces at any time. He knew the Count had promised to send his coach on the old road leading through Borgo Pass. Where in God's name was the driver? 
He began to feel fear, real true fear, at the idea of being abandoned on a rocky mountainous crag in a wilderness teeming with predators, to freeze to death or be devoured in the night by wolves. The panic began to grip his heart, and he thought only of his own dear sweet Ellen, so far away in the warmth and comfort of their home. End of Act One. Nosferatu. Adapted from the screenplay by Henrik Galin.